chapter 6, beginning in verse 8. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. And he said, Go and say this to the people. Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. Then I said, How long, O Lord? And he said, Until cities lie waste without inhabitant and houses without people and the land is a desolate waste. And the Lord removes people far away, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. And though a tent will remain in it, it will be burned again, like a terebinth or an oak whose stump remains when it is felled. The holy seed is its stump. May the Lord bless the reading and now the preaching of his word to our hearts. I will never do that. How many times have you said it? Or something like it? And then, as you well know, what happens? We do what we said we would never do. Some of you could never be romantically interested in the person you're now married to. Your close friends are people you'd never have anything in common with. You'd never do this kind of work. You'd never educate your kids that way or this way or pay that much for it. Some of us even own or have owned many things. I will never do that. But then things change, don't they? Verse 8 is Isaiah's well-known proclamation, Here I am, send me. But that wasn't what he was saying just a few verses ago, was it? Here, seeing the people's need for a truth-telling prophet, he volunteers. When the call goes out, whom shall I send? Isaiah enthusiastically responds in God's service. Now, admittedly, his attitude before wasn't, I won't go. It was, I can't. Miles away from send me, Isaiah thought he wasn't going anywhere but Sheol. He thought he was dead. He saw the holiness of God and the wickedness of his own sin, and he thought for sure that would be the end of him. The only service he anticipated was as an object lesson. Hey, y'all, look at this corpse. This is what happens when a sinful human encounters God's holiness. But clearly something changed for and in Isaiah. Because in three verses, we've gone from woe is me for I am lost to here I am, send me. And it's not as though this change could be explained by the appeal of the opportunity before him. While Isaiah's send me is the most remembered part of this morning's passage, it's God who has the most to say. And what he has to say isn't pretty. Go and say this to the people. Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Seeing, but do not perceive. He tells Isaiah that in his ministry, he will make the heart of this people dull so that they do not see and hear, and ultimately, so that they do not turn. This isn't the kind of message we expect to come from God when teaching his prophet how to be successful in ministry. But don't forget chapter 5. Don't forget all that we've been reading so far about Judah in Isaiah. That God's own people are not listening to him. How their prosperity has made them blind to their need. They live how they want to live, taking advantage of others and perverting justice. They worship how they want to worship, simply going through the motions with God while tolerating and participating in idolatry. God invites them to worship in his presence, and they couldn't care less. Verse 9. 
patience that God appointed for them has run out. They're arrogantly stubborn, refusing to listen to God and to his prophets. And it's not that they're at the point of no return. Repentance would still turn back God's hand of judgment. But they will not repent. Not even under Isaiah's ministry. It's probably not hard to find volunteers for ministry when you're promised earthly success. The kind of ministry where everyone listens to you, sign me up. Yes, you'd have to tell them about their sin, but also about what God has done for them and how God in his grace enables them to do everything he requires of them. And with the promise of success, ministry would be great. Oh, I didn't know I was sinful, everyone would say. Thank you for telling me. This salvation from God is amazing. I receive his forgiveness and righteousness, and I'm grateful to walk in new obedience. I tell you what, if that's the deal of ministry, then here am I, send me. And that is the message of godly ministry. It is the message Isaiah has to deliver to the people, that despite their sin and rebellion, God is always offering forgiveness and salvation to those who repent. But what's different is the result. The effect of this message on Isaiah's audience will not be so heartwarming. The result's not quite so visibly transformative. A remnant, most visible through future generations, will be saved through his preaching. But amongst most of the people, Isaiah's ministry will bear little fruit or at least fruit of a different kind. What his ministry will be most effective for, God says, is blinding the people, making them even more set on their own ways and their own worship. Their rebellion will continue and their hearts will become even harder. And that's not just in the short term either. Several scholars pointed out that Isaiah would need to have a long-term perspective on his ministry because this obstinacy and rebellion that he was going to experience was going to last for more than 60 years. Responding to the gospel in faith saves Judah could turn and be healed, but they will not. And so the service Isaiah is volunteering for is not glamorous. He's signing up to be the prophet who decade after decade tries to show Judah what they will not see and to offer them what they will not accept. And the consequences of that rejection and unbelief will be severe. Their nation will be taken away. They'll be carried off into exile. It won't be because they weren't warned. Isaiah told them, but their ears were heavy and their eyes were blind. Biblical preaching, the word of God for the people of God, is effective. One way or another, it's always effective. There was a surprising internet controversy this week as a popular evangelical minister spent a great deal of effort encouraging churches to stop relying on preaching as the heart of their teaching ministry. His recommendation was to reduce preaching to 10 or 15 minutes, relying instead on liturgy and Sunday school as the primary ways for God to teach and persuade his people. Now, the Bible does not say anything about how long or short a sermon should be. Many sermons, including some of my own, are longer than they need to be. But to purposefully reduce the role of preaching in worship is to fail to understand what the Bible does say about preaching. It says that through the folly of what we preach, those who believe are being saved. It says that preaching is the interpretation of spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. Preaching happens when the Spirit of the Lord anoints and enables a man to bring good news to the poor and to proclaim liberty to the captives. 
Paul exhorted Timothy to preach with patience both when preaching is popular and when preaching is not. Yes, the earthly results of preaching will always be a mixed bag. The results of Isaiah's ministry aren't what any preacher is eager to see. That's why the effectiveness of preaching is not measured by those results, but by whether or not it faithfully glorifies God. And when preaching is taking place, when people are being invited to turn and be healed, one way or another, something is happening. This is true even in the case of Isaiah and Judah when, when turning is not what's happening. Another pastor put it this way, more eloquent than I. He said, every time you hear the word of God preached, you come away from that exposure to his truth either a little closer to God or a little further away from God, either more softened toward God or more hardened. Because whichever it is, you never come away from preaching exactly the same as you were. Through his preaching, Isaiah's audience will, by and large, become more hardened toward God. It's disappointing, but not surprising. Because consider this, with all of the wonderful and familiar verses in Isaiah, think about all the passages in Isaiah that most Christians know by heart, or at least by reference on hearing, including this morning's, here I am, send me. Think about everything Isaiah has to say, and do you know what verses in the book of Isaiah are the most quoted in the New Testament? It's verses 9 and 10. It's these. You'll find them in all four Gospels because Jesus quoted them against his own generation. And then Luke writing about Paul saying them in Acts. And then Paul saying them in his letter to the Romans. And after working through John's Gospel over the last year, it's pretty easy to understand why, isn't it? It was a hard-hearted generation. They flatly opposed Jesus and his good news. Things would be little different for the apostles. Isaiah's message will fail to achieve wide acceptance because Isaiah's message is the grace of God, and that's a message that the world always violently opposes. Isaiah's warned that nearly his entire generation will reject this grace. Jesus warned the disciples that they would go into entire cities that would reject this grace. And when we proclaim the gospel in this world, we should be prepared for that same rejection. Because if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. And if you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. That's what God is saying to Isaiah here. And it's not reassuring, but it is important. Because when rejection comes, Isaiah should not be discouraged, and he should never give up. As he volunteers enthusiastically for this ministry, send me, he also needs to prepare himself to deal with the obstinate and the unregenerate. He needs to recognize that because the power of gospel preaching, because of the power of gospel preaching, his words will have the effect of moving people away from the grace of of God. And the church cannot be discouraged either, even when the effects seem grim. We proclaim the truth to the world, knowing that this proclamation will cause many to harden their resistance to it. But just as the outcome shouldn't prevent us from speaking, that outcome also shouldn't excuse our speaking callously or indifferently. Isaiah did not want to see his brothers and sisters in Judah hardened against God. He did not scold and lecture them as if he is high above them. No, he pleaded with them even before he knew it from the foot of the cross. The reason for sharing the gospel, even at the risk of hardening someone in unbelief, is that we know it's the only thing that can save. It's not take it or leave it, I don't care. 
It's pleading with tears in our eyes and gratitude in our hearts that they, like we, could turn and be saved. <laughs> One of the reformers pointed out that in ministry, we can never lay aside our human feelings. On the contrary, compassion for our brothers and sisters is what moves us to share the good news. It's why kindness rather than niceness is the fruit of the Spirit. It's not nice to tell someone about sin and its consequences, especially their own sin. But it is kind when it's paired with the offer of life-giving forgiveness. Isaiah finds no joy in telling his brothers about their impending captivity. But turning to God in repentance is the only thing that can save them. And so if he loves them, he must tell them what God has to say. That's not why the result in the heavens, regardless of the result among humans, is that God is always glorified by this. He's glorified by the believer willing to speak the truth in love to those he loves. He's glorified in salvation by all those who turn to him in faith. And he's glorified in holiness by the righteous judgment that await all who reject his grace. And that's what will come for the Judeans who are hardened by Isaiah's warning. Then I said, how long, O Lord? And he said, until cities lie waste without inhabitant. Isaiah understands the message. He understands what God is calling him to do and what will come of this message when it is rejected. And so he asks, how long, O Lord? He asks because he wants to know the extent of this consequence, not just how long in years, but implicitly how broad will it be rejected truly by everyone? Will no one hear and believe and turn? And it's there in this message of judgment where we find this kernel of gospel. There will be massive destruction for Judah. Siege, war, captivity, and exile, cities laid waste. But yet, despite the near total devastation, God will mercifully preserve a remnant, a tenth, this holy seed, which is the stump from which the gospel of Christ will grow. These are the ones who are holy because he has made them holy by bringing them to himself rather than allowing them to continue in their own way, a way that always grows cold and hard-hearted toward God. Instead, God intervened. He consecrated these to himself, the ones who will glorify him in salvation and in obedience. And if you believe this is you. Isaiah ministered among a selfish, hard-hearted, and godless generation. And yet even so, there were some who heard, believed, turned, and were saved. Jesus lamented the wickedness of a generation so wicked it would reject the Messiah standing before him and crucify the innocent one. The disciples even with the evidence of the resurrection as the power of their ministry, still largely suffered martyrs' deaths on account of unbelief. And yet in that generation, the church exploded and went throughout the world, and many heard and turned and were saved. So tell me again what you were saying about our generation, that no one will ever believe the things have never been this bad before. Yes, we live in this present evil age. But Christian, there has never been a generation of humanity where God wasn't preserving a people for himself and calling people out of that darkness into his glorious light. God hasn't stopped working. In Isaiah's generation, in Jesus and the disciples, 
and in hours there are people waiting to call upon the name of the Lord and how will they call on him in whom they've not believed and how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard and how are they to hear without someone preaching But maybe your resistance is less to preaching and more about whether or not you are the kind of person who could invite others to receive the grace of God. That's not for me. I'm here, Lord, but you need to send somebody else. Do you believe that you can be someone who regularly tells others about the good news of Jesus Christ? Or is it, I would never do that? What changed Isaiah from woe is me to send me was God's salvation. The very message of repentance and salvation that he's to take into the unbelieving world is the message that made him able and willing to take it there. Isaiah's own experience of being made clean, of receiving the righteousness that comes from God, that's what made him willing and eager to serve, just as the angels who surround God's throne. I need you to recognize that what holds us back from God's service is not capability. It's sin and guilt. We cannot serve God because of our sin. We do not want to serve God because of our sin. But when forgiveness made Isaiah clean and free from guilt, we get the vision of how it does the same for us. Forgiveness, new life in Christ, makes us able and ready to serve. Scripture says in Hebrews that if the Old Testament sacrifices had any usefulness whatsoever, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Don't you understand? He didn't just save you for salvation. He saved you for service. Isaiah recognized his own death in sin. And then, seeing righteousness and new life in himself through the work of God, he springs to action, ready to serve regardless of the difficulty. That's what the gospel does. It saves us from sin. It releases us from slavery to sin and death and into the service of God. When we feel no such freedom. Listen to me very carefully, adults and children. There will be times in life where we do not feel as though we could be useful at all in the service of God. But that is a feeling. That is not reality. And what that feeling comes from is the very sin, and specifically the guilt of sin, from which he has set us free. Another pastor said what silences Christians is this very curious mingling between the self-admiration that we have, thinking we're really good, but really the contrast with the guilty fear that God is against me. We're limited in our service to God because of this, this guilty fear of something that isn't even true, that God is against me. And his remedy, the remedy for this feeling, the remedy that equips us to serve God joyfully, 
It's the blood of Christ that purifies our consciences so that then we can and will serve the living God. You see, while a guilty conscience binds you, it locks you up. It makes you ineffective in God's service. Salvation by grace unleashes you for productivity in the kingdom. What animates Isaiah is not the prospect of earthly success in ministry. I trust you see that from the description. Isaiah is animated by the opportunity to respond to God's grace. What changed in Isaiah is the gospel. And because he's experienced that change so deeply and so personally, it animates everything he does in service to God. And by way of application, I do have to say, this is one of the more relieving messages to be able to give to a congregation. And it's not because I think all of you are confident and eager messengers of God's grace, nor am I this morning. I know that in this room, as in every room, there's unbelief. And even more, there are those who think that they have little to offer in God's service. And so what's relieving is not the dilemma. It's the remedy. Because what the unbelieving heart needs is grace. The heart that is not satisfied with God's grace needs more grace. The Christian woman who doubts how God could ever use her for good, she needs more grace. And the man who is not grateful toward God needs more grace. It's relieving because I want to be a man who says, here I am, send me. I want to be a pastor of a congregation of believers who say, here am I, send me me our session wants to be this church to be one that's known in dunwoody and in atlanta for the generous overflow of the fruits of the spirit as we witness to the gospel of jesus in word and deed and to accomplish those things to bring about the changes that's needed in us what's required is not more from us but more of god's grace God will bring this change. What a relief and what great grace.